and it is um, my pleasure to introduce someone I've known for a long time. I've known everybody a long time these days, but a long time in ELT, uh, Christopher Graham, who I've had the pleasure of listening to and uh, consulting with and working with over the years. Uh, if you don't know Christopher Graham, he has uh, he's a freelance English language teaching consultant, educator and author based in the United Kingdom. He's worked in ELT since 1981 and worked in over 30 countries for the British Council, Ministries of Education and international publishers. His recent projects have included working on approaches to digital provision of ELT during COVID, delivering large scale professional development programs online for the British Council in, in North Africa and supporting universities in the UK in response to the COVID pandemic. Perhaps one of the reasons he's here today is one of the founders of ELT Footprint, which won the Elton in 2020. And of course, 2021, he's worked on research, materials, writing and media and activities, sorry, media activities around ELT and climate change for the British Council as part of the Climate Action in Language Education project. So without any more further ado, it is over to Christopher for his session today. Enjoy the session, Chris, and I'm here if you need me. Lovely, thank you very much indeed, Sean. Thank you especially for reminding me how long I've been working in English language teaching since 1981. That's quite a long time, isn't it? Um, never done anything else, but there we are. Too late to change now, I think. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are in the world. It's 10 o'clock in a very, looking out my window, a very gray and rainy London, but I'm sure some of you are in much warmer places and some of you probably in colder places as well. Um, when I when I wrote this talk, uh, particularly the title, I, I, I thought maybe I should have called it the uh, Global Climate Emergency English Teaching. What's it got to do with me? Um, but I changed it slightly to just and me, um, because I think for some people, the connection between the uh, the climate emergency, global warming and all, all the issues around that, that connection with English language teaching is not necessarily immediately obvious. So that's really what I want to explore today what does it have to do with us and what can we do about it um so there's a little overview of the areas that that, that, that i'm going to cover um i'll let you just read it for one second there as ever i have quite a lot of material but as sean has said this the both the recordings and the uh, copies of the of the powerpoints will be available about 10 days after this so if there's something you missed or you want to explore further you'll have access to these to these materials as well Uh, Rachel Carson was an American writer, a scientist, and this book, as you can see, was published in 1962. And um, if you are interested in early thinking about the climate emergency and about the environmental crisis, I do recommend this book. It's, uh, it's a book that, as I put at the stop there, makes you stop and think. The idea that the war against nature is a war against ourselves is a fairly is a fairly chilling thought, I think, isn't it? But I absolutely understand what she means. Um, so what is the ELT community? Because we, we are in this uh, little talk, we're talking quite a lot about the ELT community. Well, it's you, obviously, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a teacher educator, whether you're an academic, whether you're a student even, whatever you are, you're part of that community. But of course, there are lots of other members of the community. There are, there are the institutions, the schools of whatever kinds. There are institutions, study abroad institutions in the US, the UK, Australia, where people study, uh, travel to study English uh, to join uh, short summer courses or long term courses. There are publishers like Oxford University Press, one of the stakeholders. There are the organizations that, that uh, produce the tests, exams and assessment tools that we use in our classes. And of course, there are teacher associations and conferences like IATEFO, like TESOL, and your local teacher association or local conference or regional conference that you might go to. All of those different stakeholders make up the ELT community. It's much broader than, than just your school. We are part of a massive community, but of course, the most important part of the community are the students, the learners. Um, John Nag, who used to work for the British Council, he's now retired, came up with this wonderful statistic a few years ago that at any one time there were one and a half billion learners learning English. That's billion, not million. It's not a, not, not a typo. That's a truly remarkable thing, isn't it, when you think about it? Um, I've no idea how he counted them, but um, I'm satisfied just that it's such a big number. And I think I'd like you to keep that that number, that volume of students in your mind as we go through the talk, because I think it's really important to think about 
the force for good that the ELT community can be in terms of the climate community, given that we have one and a half billion learners at any one time scattered all over the planet. This is a quotation from a book. Uh, it's, it's actually in two, two pieces of quotation. I'd like you just to read it for one minute, and then I'll, I'll tell you what the book is on the second slide that follows. Let's give you one minute to read that through. And here's the second part. Uh, James Rebanks is a farmer in the northwest of England, in the English Lake District. And um, that book, English Pastoral, um, is one of the most powerful books about the climate crisis that I've ever read, even though it's, it is a book about farming. It's about agriculture, but it's about a man written by a man who cares very much about the planet. And those last few words, those who had so little courage and wisdom that we turned away from our responsibilities, I think is something that we really should keep right at the front of our thinking and uh, both our professional lives and in in in, uh, in in our private lives our home lives so let's think first of all about the negative impact of the elt community that great community i mentioned before the bad stuff the things that we do that are actually contributing to the climate crisis um perhaps the most obvious thing is we use a lot of paper um we use books we use handouts we use worksheets so many of us photocopy things, handouts that we want to give to our students that get used once and then thrown away. So we use a lot of paper. The process of printing has an environmental impact. The inks, the dyes, that process has an impact. Packaging, we buy things in boxes that are packaged in plastic sometimes. Books, exam papers, equipment we use in school is packaged that packaging has an environmental impact shipping we buy things from other countries our books sometimes are printed locally but very often come from abroad and perhaps the word shipping is wrong we should talk about flying books because very often books are flown in our schools and our institutions our offices wherever we work we burn energy we, uh, we 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 burn gas we burn electricity just in our day-to-day -day activities in 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 our work and waste um we all waste a lot we waste paper we waste plastic uh we waste food sometimes if 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 us if if we if we sell lunches or dinners or or food in our schools there are lots and lots of negative impacts many of which we're increasingly aware about and we're increasingly doing something about but we shouldn't be complacent should we really we need to do our best it's simple things like getting students to switch off lights at the end of the lesson or air conditioning or heating depending where you work at the end of the class at the end of the day um it's about recycling handouts or maybe having no handouts at all just not Ask, just asking students to write things in their books rather than giving them a handout. We have a lot of impacts and we need to have conversations with ourselves and we need to have conversations with our colleagues about this. And then we have to talk about our friend COVID. Um, this quotation here from uh, Rahm Emanuel, who, as I said, is chief of staff to President Obama when President Obama was uh, was in office, I think is really interesting. COVID was a global crisis. Um, it affected virtually everybody on the planet in some way or other, either personally or through the changes they had to make in their lives. But oddly, it was also an opportunity. Many of us changed the way we work whether we travel to work anymore, whether we travel to school anymore, whether we traveled abroad to study. Uh, there were a lot of changes in the way we worked. And there is, I suppose, some sort of dividend or benefit from COVID for the environment. And that's what I want to explore for a second. Well, let's look at two, two aspects of, of, of the COVID dividend. Um, 
the first one is this what we're doing now embracing online now those of you who had to start teaching online when covid began will probably have unhappy memories of the first i don't know two or three weeks when you were working on zoom or teams or whichever platform you were using um some people here in the moderating team will, 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 will probably won't have had these problems because they're they're much more digitally um engaged than many of us are but for for people like me the first couple of weeks working on zoom were fairly disastrous muting unmuting no video not knowing how to operate uh, the the breakout rooms all these things we had to learn i think it's fair to say that as a community we have embraced online delivery of classes we may not like it all the time the learners may not like it all the time but we can do it and i think we can be very proud of that and also we're increasingly exploring ways of assessing of uh delivering exams and uh, other other uh, measurements and measure, measuring and assessing tools online it is becoming fairly common now for exams to be taken online all of this, of course, has an environmental benefit because if people are not traveling to school or you're not traveling to work, you're working from home, students are working from home, there is a green dividend. Of course, there is much less use made of transport, much less use made of energy, in, as I mentioned before, in schools and institutions, less paper. Um, this, of course, has to be balanced greatly against the uh, benefit or disbenefits of the learning that goes on. But it is a fact that it has had an environmental benefit. There is a digital footprint of what we are doing now. Streaming, streaming as we're doing now does have a significant environmental impact. We're still learning what that impact is. But I think it's fairly clear it is not as much as it would be if we were all traveling face to face and to, to, to be face to face. So there is a COVID dividend. And the second thing that I think we, we, we now we, we're not all necessarily we, now we've all spent some time working online and just going back to face to face as we go back to face to face. I think we can start thinking about more about basic waste, recycling, better packaging. We need to think to ourselves, do we really need books with glossy covers on them? Do we really need that? Do our books come in boxes that are where the paper that does that is used for packaging is recycled? Um, are we aware of switching lights on and off, switching air conditioning off at the end of the day? So I think going back to school, as most people are doing, not everybody is back, I know, but in increasingly now most of the world has gone back to school face to face. I think this is an opportunity to take a breath, to reassess. A lot of people say that COVID in effect was a chance for them to stop and look at their lives and a lot of people have done that they, they change the way that they they live and the way that they work i think this is a moment for us to look at the way we run our schools and i think it's it, it this as i say covid is a dreadful thing but there is a kind of dividend a bonus that's come from it um i've been working uh with the british council uh, as Sean kindly mentioned at the beginning, for about a year now, um, one of the projects I've been working on is a report um, around climate change, which will be published uh, toward, towards the end of this month, the early part of next month. And I've got a few findings from it. And one of them is a quotation here from, from a publisher, a large educational publisher, saying, now we go digital first. Um, our catalogues will be electronic. Materials for conferences will be ele electronic. The, the large stakeholders such as the publishers are very aware and are making real moves to reduce their environmental footprint. And here's another quote, just going back a little bit to something I said before from, from another publisher about the measurement of a digital product. In other words, three hours teaching online, what is the environmental impact of three hours teaching online compared to three hours teaching in school face to face. That's an immensely complicated piece of mathematics well beyond my uh, non mathematical brain. But people are beginning, as I said, to, to develop tools to measure this, the, the, the comparative impact. Are we much better environmentally teaching online? 
than we are face to face. And if the environmental impact is much less, what do we do about it? Do we twice a week teach online? What do we do as schools? What do we do as organizations? These are big questions. It is a climate crisis. It is an emergency. So we need to think about these questions. Um, the way that I tend to look at this uh, discussion is to uh, look at a whole institution, what I've called a holistic view there. In other words, to look at, it could be a primary school, it could be a private language school, it could be a university, and to look at it in two halves. One half is to look at what we teach the integration and embedding of environmental topics into our teaching. Uh, I know other people, Harry spoke about it yesterday and Zarina did as well, but I'll be mentioning a little bit today. So there's, there's that side, the teaching side, but we also need to think about the other side, the way we operate our schools, the way we use, as I said, handouts, the way we use energy, electricity, gas, water. Do we have uh, reusable cups for, for tea or coffee in the staff room? Do we have huge piles of unrecycled paper in the staff and that's not being used for anything, encouraging people to use that? So think about your school in two ways, what you teach and how the school operates, how the school works in terms of its impact on the environment. Another quotation to look at there from Harvard Business Review. Create a movement, stir emotion, incite action. This is how organizations change, not by pe being people being told what to do, but by movements very often from the bottom. So what can you as a teacher do about it? Well, you can agitate and lobby for the green lens. The green lens, it's like a lens on my glasses. We look at everything through the green lens. So we see everything we do in a green context. So if you think there's something in your school that you could do better, or could be done better environmentally, put your hand up and ask for it. Suggest it. Maybe get work with some colleagues. Say, we think we could do this better. Well, we do use a lot of paper, don't we? Could we not try this, perhaps? Whatever you think the solution is. Aim for a no-waste classroom and only recycle as a last resort. Recycling is fine, but ultimately we need to just reduce the amount of waste that we don't need to recycle. So minimizing handouts, getting learners involved. We'll talk more about the student voice later, but there's no doubt that teenagers, if you teach teenagers, older primary or teenagers, their desire to do something about the climate crisis is very powerful. So let's get them involved in reduce, reuse, recycle notice recycle become is the last one reduce is the first one and use learners should say learners not leaners use learners as monitors get learners to remind you so what about the light should we switch the lights off or why have we got all these handouts i have no problem if someone says that to me um we have to work together on this so looking at everything through the green lens through green glasses Another thing you can do as a teacher is to listen to the kids. As I say, students, learners, they are the people who very often feel the most, the strongest commitment towards managing the climate crisis. Uh, Generation Greta, Generation Greta Thunberg, um, there is no doubt they have powerful emotions we need to listen to that they'll often be the people who you can who, who will agitate for change in schools um find out what's happening in your town your village or your community in terms of the environment and try to integrate what you're doing with what's happening outside so if you find out there's a project i don't know maybe in the local park to to, to pick up plastic and paper See if you, you, you could take some of your students out to get involved in that. 
go whole school try to get the whole school community involved all the way up from the school director or head teacher all the way through the the, the other teachers the students parents anyone involved with the school to try and make a commitment to making the school a green entity and also get learners involved in practical projects growing or clearing by growing wonderful projects you can find around the world with primary students planting and growing vegetables sometimes fruit sometimes flowers depending on where you live in the world and what your climate is or as i said clearing projects taking students out to the beach to the park to pick up pieces of plastic pieces of uh, of waste that other people have left there so there's quite a lot of things you can do as a teacher do we need to do more yes we do need to do more um th there are elephants in the room that particular elephant is in hong kong but there are elephants in the room and elephants in the room remember is something that's very big it's so big that we don't really want to talk about it but we all know it's there because we can feel it breathing um these are the the, the controversial things flying to study um international study is a very very big thing so many hundreds of thousands of students every year are fortunate enough to be able to travel abroad to study that has an impact in terms of flying and maybe we need to reconsider that we need to think is that the right thing to be doing the same for conferences um and i i am someone uh, who some of you who know me here will know i have spent many hours traveling around the world to conferences face to face i wonder if we really do need to do that anymore now we have this um the wonderful thing about this ltoc is i don't know how many people are involved but the, the numbers are big if this conference were held in oxford it would be a tiny fraction of people because you would not be able to simply would not be able to come would not be able to get here so not only do online conferences like this reduce our our, our climate our, our, our environmental footprint but that means people can come from all over the world even if it's the middle of the night where you are you can still uh, get up and, and and come to the conference um digital materials are we going to see more digital materials more online or on a tablet or on a phone elt materials i don't know the answer to that i don't know whether teachers want it i don't know whether students want it but certainly there is a possible environmental benefit from that and what i call backsliding covid stopped us flying around the world it stopped us doing lots and lots of things are we going to go back to how it was or are we going to uh, stop and think hmm do I need to do that? I mean, for example, before COVID, I flew a lot and I wasn't happy about it, but my job required me to fly a lot. And there is an impact of that. Of course, along came COVID and flying stopped. Uh, I've flown once in the last, over just over two years now. That's all, just once. And uh, I've no plans to fly again this year, I don't think, who knows? Um, but there would be the possibility to backslide to go back to our old habits again so we we, we need to to monitor ourselves i think or keep, keep an eye on ourselves as far as that goes there's another quote from the great malala i love this pick up your books and pens they are the most powerful weapons isn't she right that's one of the things that made me want to be a teacher in the first place i think and uh, i think uh, i think many of you sitting here will think mm, yeah that's why i do it as well that's why i do this job so let's think a little bit about the classroom opportunities i've talked about non-classroom things about energy and electricity and making your school a, a greener entity a greener organization a greener institution but let's think a little bit about what we do in class it's in our hands as teachers to integrate more environmental climate change topics into our lessons it's in our hands to do that but it takes time 
and I know from my own experience as a teacher and the fact I work with, with a lot of teachers now on a regular basis is that time is not our friend. We do not have very much time ever, e even, even in a, the best circumstances, teachers are very busy. It does take time to introduce green topics. How much you do it, of course, affects the time. How deeply you do it affects the time, but it takes time. It needs some creativity. It needs some imagination, I think. You need to be able to think, mm, okay, there's something. There's something we can do. Let's do that. We can try that. That takes some creativity. And I think very importantly, collaboration is very, very important. Um, one of the things that I found out about from the research project that I've just finished for the British Council was that and this was a global project, a uh, global research project. We spoke to people from, from, from all over the world. And um, I found out some wonderful and exciting projects around the world that are going on, environmental projects around the world that are going on, except nobody ever told anybody else about them. Collaboration and sharing is so important because if you have something that works in your class, it will work in all the other English classes in your school. And interestingly, it will work in other schools around the world. So sharing and collaboration is really, really important. You're not alone in this. And as I say, it does take time to uh, to produce materials. So let's let's collaborate to save time. Here's another little piece from from the uh, the British Council project. Um, we did a sample on uh, one of the British Council uh, English Teaching for Teens websites. We did a survey for teenagers and. Um, Overall, the sample size was about 3,000, but, but, but th this, this is a smaller sample size of about 500 students. And we asked if their school, and bear in mind this is global, um, had done anything, any projects about climate change. And you'll see that 75% said that they hadn't, which wasn't a surprise. This survey was done probably about eight months ago, so it may have changed slightly since then, but, but it won't, probably won't have changed significantly. But this is the one that makes us all need to sit up. Again, it's a slightly smaller sample. Uh, the size of the... Uh, my screen went blank for a second. Okay. Um, the sample size uh, is a result of how many uh, teenagers actually completed the survey. Um, it's quite a small sample size, but look at that statistic. The question was basically, do you want to explore climate topics in your English language classes? 71%. Yes, which is quite, that's quite a figure. It's a figure for us all to think about whether we're publishers, whether we're teachers, whether we're school managers. So bear that one in mind. Let's change to the next slide. I'm not getting the slides. Ah, oh, they are changing. Okay. So, I think I think you've slowed down, Chris. I if think you're working they are with course books, you have a they are changing, but I think your connection yeah, is slowed. It's it's kind of so they are if you you've yeah, it, you've jumped ahead anyway. a little. Uh, so you want to be on slide 22, yeah? Working with course books. Yeah, I'm, I'm on it now. Yeah, I'm working on, I'm okay, on cool. it now, yeah. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, so course books. We, uh, we all have course books, whether they're locally produced or whether they come from, from uh, an international publisher. We all have our course books. Working with course books in terms of integrating... Ah, I've jumped forward now sorry don't touch it leave this. it leave it leave it you, you, chris you're moving the okay. slides uh, i need to go just, back to the previous it, uh, it'll move the more you press it the more you'll move mess your slides up <laughs> gotcha so okay i'm on the right one now yeah thanks uh, i want to go back to the previous one do you, what do you want to be on slide 22 or 21 yeah 22 okay is go forward work, once working with course yeah, books. next one please yeah okay it's on so working with course books is the one that is currently on the screen for the audience 
Okay, I'm not seeing it, unfortunately. Okay, so your connection is a little now. bit slow. Okay, fantastic. But... Thanks. For that. Yeah, a little bit behind. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, so course books. One technique when look, working with course books is to do what I call find the hook. By a hook, I mean something in a course book that you can connect a topic, probably in a course book, that you can connect somehow to an environmental topic. The best way is to look through the, uh, the contents of the course book and think, OK, something here, something here, something here, something here. Generally, we just need to make very small changes, small tweaks, let's call them. And sometimes you need quite a lot of creativity as well. But often you find your hook. Ah, there's something there. There's a chapter here. There's a unit here. There's an activity here about holidays. Oh, they're flying. Look, they're going to the airport. Hmm. Can we just tweak that slightly and bring up the whole issue of flying and the impact of it? Collate and share. Keep everything that you produce and share it in your school. As I said, you, sharing saves time for everybody. Right, I'm just gonna wait for this slide to change so I can see it. It's up now, so there's obviously a delay of a few seconds between it. you. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Okay, it should come up any second now then, hopefully. It's not displaying it. It it, it is Christopher. It is there yeah, it for is, yeah. everybody else. It's there for them, only for me. I'm always behind the rest of the world. Is how I am. Um, 21st century skills absolutely lend themselves very much to the climate discussion and the climate debate. Um, the famous four C's of creativity, communication, critical thinking, collaboration that many of us are familiar with, the 21st century skills, um, sit very well with climate issues. For example, the discussion about the impact of flying. If, how can we find alternatives to flying? Discussions around how can we encourage people to recycle more glass, paper, cardboard, these things. Um, all of that sits very, very well with the use of 21st century skills. Some of you may also have heard about the idea of translanguaging. Translanguaging effectively is allowing the students under certain circumstances to use their first language in class as part of their communication process. Um, for example, you may have a text about an aspect of climate change. Let's say about um, the effect of traffic pollution from buses and other vehicles on the climate. These texts can be quite complex sometimes. Particularly for, for high school level students, the texts are quite difficult because it's quite a lot of science and complex ideas. You may feel with lower level students that they could read a text in your local language about the impact of buses and trucks on the local environment. But they produce, for example, a poster or PowerPoint presentation in English about their ideas for managing this problem. And I think translanguaging, which is becoming very much uh, part of our collection of, of techniques certainly has a, uh, a, a is a very useful tool to help us deal with the complexity of um uh of some of the topics in 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 uh, in uh, climate uh, climate topics right it should have changed again there it is you can also create your own content away from the course book Adapting your course book is relatively straightforward. Creating your own content is a much more complex thing to do and takes a lot more time. And a few things I think you should think about. Um, think about relevance. I think learners, particularly teenage learners, they know about the climate problem and they're kind of angry about it or they know about it, but, but what's it got to do with us? with me and i think 
try to find topics that have a local impact. I spoke to some students in Central Europe quite recently, teenage students, about climate change. And they were kind of, well, yeah, I know, but yeah, we don't have any polar bears and we don't have any of these problems. We don't see the impact. And the, yeah, it's a bit hotter, but oh, it doesn't, OK, it doesn't really affect us. And I said, what about those floods you had in the mountains last year and two years before? Oh, that's climate change, that's climate change. Local impact, they engage immediately. Images, be careful with images. That's a lovely cat, that's not my cat. Um, be careful with images. Um, there were some horrible images of dead polar bears, of, of, of other animals and creatures that have, that, that, that have suffered as a result of the climate crisis. Many of these photographs, very young, I find them upsetting, but, but young learners find them very upsetting. But equally, they do have the effect of demotivating students quite significantly, I think. Um, so be careful with pictures. And there is this thing called eco-hopelessness. I can't do anything about this. It's too difficult for me to do. And I think that's, that, that's very common. Be careful, as I said before, about the complexity of the text. And also be careful about the complexity of the content. Do they actually know that content in the first language? Because if they don't understand it easily in their own language, they're going to find it even more difficult in a second language, I think. Project work. Here's a project from Moldova in Central Europe. Um, and there's just an example of, of, of a poster that tells uh, a PowerPoint slide, I should say, that some students provided. School projects are a fantastic way. Creating posters to spread the word. Eco surveys, asking their parents, asking other teachers, asking other students. What do they know about the environmental crisis? What do they worry about? Um, what do they not know about? What do they not care about? And also getting students planting, as I said before, the idea of having students planting materials, planting uh, flowers, uh, fruit, depending on your climate. So projects, they generate language and they also create, um, enhance and create environmental awareness. Out of school projects. There's a nice park in London I found, isn't that beautiful? Um, so beach or park cleans. Concentrating on their home environment, how green is their home? And let's think about our diets as well. Many of you will be aware of the, con the, the, the connection between diet and uh, the climate crisis. So again, that's a topic that can be discussed. So project work out of school and project work in, sc project work in school as well. Hopefully that's changed. <coughs> There's an example of a project in Uzbekistan. I'll just take you a couple of minutes to read it. It's about planting. Beans in this case. I'll just wait for the slide to change. Should change the next one. Hasn't changed, has it? We're on twenty. There it is. There's a nice project in Turkey. Yeah, thank you, Sean. There's a nice one there about water. Students estimating and understanding their water usage and being surprised how much water is used in their day-to-day -day lives and interestingly getting students to sign agreements to sign pledges saying i will reduce my water use change through to the next one sure what's the next slide i've got it okay here's an exciting project um from International House, which is, as those of you who, who don't know, is a large group of English, private English language schools um, around the world. And they have this lovely project called the Young Environmentalist Project. I'll give you one minute or two just to read it through.
the Young Environmentalist Project is designed to get teenagers in different countries, different schools around the world to work together on green projects, presentations, posters, um, practical projects where they share ideas. It's about developing international collaboration uh, amongst students. And I think the point there in the quotation is really interesting. They like it. They like to engage with each other. And the global nature of it is very important. The globality of it is very important. The fact that you have a student in uh, maybe in Italy working with a student in uh, maybe in Egypt on a project across cultures. We should be on the next one in a second. Sorry about the lagging. I don't know what's happening. It, it's changing. There's another one from Moldova. I'll give you a second to read that. Again, a very similar project. Yeah, I realise that. Yeah. I can just, all I can do is try and find the slides to look at on another device, which I can do very quickly, I think. I can find them. So this again is an international global project. Jump through to the next one. I'll just find what the slides is so I can keep up with you another way around. Has it gone forwards? So we're currently on 31. What's the, which is, what's the title, Sean? What support do teachers need? I'm not a scientist. I don't know where to start. No right. resources, no time. Okay. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute, hopefully. I don't know why it's just not changing for me. Let me find it on here quickly and then I can just do it another way. Uh, It's not moving for me at all. One second. No worries. Can I help? Do you want me to uh, move right. slides or anything? Yeah, I've got it now. I've, it's, I can see it now, Sean. Thank you. So sure. these are some of the questions that teachers will often have, the, the, the alarm bells that ring. I'm not a scientist. I don't know where to start. I haven't got any resources. I haven't got any time. It's not my job. Well, I'm not a scientist. And I'm not a scientist either. I was dreadful at, and terrible at science at school. So um, my answer to that is we're not asking you to teach. We're not asking you to do environmental education. We're not asking you to teach the science behind climate change. We're encouraging you to uh, open students' eyes and increase their awareness of the problem through the medium of English. If you want to know more about the science, we have the internet. If you work in a school, you also have science teachers, geography teachers, biography teach, uh, biology teachers, uh, physics teachers, even geog geography, different subject areas. Go and talk to them. They'll often give you a 10 minute, a nice little 10 minute summary of what climate change actually is and what its impacts are. I don't know where to start is a very common thing. Um, there are lots of online resources that, 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 that you can look at that I'll share with you in a second um, that will allow you to um, find materials around from around the world. No resources. Resources are coming. They're becoming more available. I don't have time. I absolutely understand there's no time. That's where collaboration, working with other teachers, sharing ideas. Don't do what somebody has already done somewhere else in your school, in your city. Try and use their materials again. That saves time. It's not my job. Hmm. Well, maybe it's not your job, but perhaps it's fair to say it's your responsibility. That might be a better way of putting it, I think. Um, the slide that you're looking at now, I think, you'll see the figure from, um, I'm now looking at another device, that teachers are definitely concerned. They feel they need training on 
the how to integrate climate topics. There are more resources around all over the world now, online resources, courses, the work the British Council has done, and I'm going to show you some, some, some links in a second. Um, but there's no doubt that um, you need to work with other people. So you should now, have they got the slide what support is available, Sean, yeah? Indeed, yes. They have. Okay, that's good. Well, what support is available? Um, you can see some links there. ELT Footprint, the organisation I was one of the founders uh, founders of. ELT Footprint UK, which takes the perspective of climate change through private language schools in the UK. ELT Sustainable and Renewable English are two other fantastic resources. And some of you met Harry yesterday in the first thing uh, talk yesterday. Um, lots and lots of resources there that you can draw on that you can download and that you can use and more widely i've listed here on the next slide um all the british council resources some of which i've been involved in all the british council resources are free and they include lesson plans they include online training there's a mooc a massive open online course which uh We'll be starting again this year around how to integrate climate topics into your teaching. Um, they also have a series of podcasts, um, talking to teachers and educators and publishers and exam people from all around the world about their experiences in integrating climate change into, into classes. So you have all of these. Um, there's ELT footprint there. So the slides are, are moving very slowly. So what I think I'm going to do now, because we're having trouble with the slides, what I'd like to do is to stop the slideshow, I think, Sean, yeah, and I'll just do a, say a few more words and then um, we'll go to Q&A because I think we're going to get bogged down with the slides. Okay, it's fine by me. Can you take them down, Sean, yeah? Then we're gonna they are down. coming down. Will, will they stay up there, yeah? They've gone down. Thank They're you. just slow for you. It's just you oh, God, behind it. Well, sorry about being a little bit a little bit slow and for every uh, behind the rest of the world. Um, my key message, I suppose, is and uh, that that quite well, that that statement. Um, it's not my job. I've had that from some teachers. Some teachers have said to me, "This this is this is really nothing to do with me. It's not my job." I mean, I probably didn't think it was my job until a while back. I didn't, I mean, I, I've, I've been involved with a little bit in green th issues over the years in my private life rather than my personal life. But the idea that it should be part of my job was, was maybe came as a surprise to me as well. And the answer I gave before about it being part of your job, I would just underline, I think it's our responsibility. Um, I said before that, 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 that showing images of dead polar bears and other animals or icebergs that have melted or the, the dreadful impacts of climate change is not a good idea. And I don't um, use those kind of images in my talks or the work that I do because I think that they are very upsetting and uh, they demotivate people. But if you go to um, any of the UN websites, you can find for yourself some of the statistics around the impact of climate change. It is absolutely horrific. And it, it's now it's a serious thing. So, no, it's not our jobs. It's our responsibilities. I think it, it really is that. Um, so when you if you do start exploring bringing climate uh, issues into your classes you might think oh god this is difficult i don't know what to do oh, i look at my coursework okay there's something on a holiday as i said they're flying do we have a little discussion about whether they could go by train or whether they should go on holiday nearer to home these kinds of discussions it takes some time it takes some creativity but as i say it's something that we can do i really think that all of us on this planet have a responsibility and we're no different from anybody else. And we're very fortunate in a sense because we have access to uh, 
to students who are the citizens of the future. I know it's a cliche, but they are people who we who who are going to be fighting this fight in uh, the, the climate fight, and who are enthusiastic about it as well. I think generally, so I think it is a responsibility that we have. But I, I would emphasize that. I would also emphasize again and again to share what you produce. Take a look at the ELT Footprint uh, Facebook page. We're always very happy to get ideas from teachers for, 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 for projects or materials that they produced. And there are other ways that you that, that you can share your work. So um, sharing, seeing it as a responsibility and accepting the challenge, I think is something that we, we all need to do. And going a little bit back to, to our learners, they are teenagers particularly i think are the most engaged young learners are aware of some of the points adults can be more challenging um there are as we all know people in the world in the global community who don't necessarily believe in climate change or believe in man-made climate change anyway so you may get adults resisting um there are challenges with different age ranges but all in all i think it's something that we have to do and if we look at our language teaching institutions our primary schools our secondary schools our universities as one unit a green school teaches green in other words the way the school works will reflect itself in how it teaches and if the learners see that you have notices in the school about switching the line if they see that you're recycling paper if they see that you're minimizing the use of plastic it becomes a whole project and i think it becomes part of the school's dna and that is how change will happen it's little pieces coming together that overall create a green movement now we've got uh six or seven minutes maybe um is there, are there any questions let me have a quick look I'm lagging behind. So, Sean, if you want to ask me any that you've got there. Yeah, but you're also lagging for me. So there's, I reckon there's about a six or seven second delay between what I say and what you hear. Um, no, even longer now. Yeah. <laughs> so the question that you will eventually hear is <laughs> how do you, um, how do you approach there's a, there are a number of people asking about dealing with those people that are skeptical in class so how do you deal with negationists or people who are climate uh, skeptics so how would you address those when you're teaching yeah. about the climate well i mean first of all i mean my 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 belief is that um obviously everyone is entitled to their opinion i mean I, I may not agree with them um i would probably direct them as i say very good sources are the the various united nations websites um uh undp but i mean most of the united nations websites do have a section on sustainability and climate change and they're in if you want them to do it in their local language it will be available in the local language as well as in english and they make some very firm arguments uh clarifying the science behind climate change but equally i think almost every country in the world there has been some impact i mean you live in the uk sean you know about this we're having a lot more floods a lot more it's getting wetter mm. and there's a reason for that um the causality i mean in 99.9 percent .9 of the world's scientific community appear to support it so i think it's it's a process of education say not from don't take it from me go to the united nations look at their websites not from me and there are some people who will ne you'll never convince um but on the other hand it's very good for the students debating skills isn't it i suppose if somebody actually really doesn't doesn't agree there, there is a benefit from it it's interesting you mentioned Anything debate because it's interesting you mentioned debate because a question is is uh, what what kind of debate should we pose to get students started in the question and i think it's debate generally as a debating subject uh what would be a good place to start local and relevant something that affects me 
and that's not just about climate change but i think in debate in, topics for debates in general students respond well to something they know about the floods as i said the floods in the mountains last year what what what, what about them oh it's terrible lots of people lost their houses da, 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 da. what caused it i don't know well did we have them two years ago yeah we did so they're more ah so i think relevance creates motivation local impact creates motivation that's what i would say um anything else Sean? some of this some of what i'm about to say in this question was answered uh, i think in other sessions but do, do you think there's an ideal age for kind of talking about climate is it more applicable to say university students can you do it with preschoolers and how would you um mitigate that the language involved when talking about the climate it probably is a bit complicated for you know, an a1 a a2 learner yeah uh personally i think we should start it at primary age six seven with with, with young learners i think that's fine um obviously conceptually it needs to be very simple but you can work on things like waste plastic bags for shopping when mum and dad go shopping that that level and i also i mean regardless of the climate i'm also as as, as, as a language educator i believe very strongly that the first language has a role and i think certain topics as i mentioned translanguaging on one of the slides certain topics are best suited to being partly addressed in the first language um or at least support for, for certain students given in the first language personally I, I i would start in primary i don't have a problem with that at all because there, there are there are certain say very obvious things when mum and dad go shopping do they take a plastic bag yeah they take lots of plastic bags why don't they use cloth bags because plastic's bad isn't it yes plastic's bad so just getting a, a seven or six year old to say in english plastic is very bad we need to use paper bags whatever cloth bags is a small victory, I think. So I would start early. And I just uh, flag up to people yeah. that um, that when the recordings become available in about 10 days time, I would direct them to uh, Zarina's session, particularly, uh, which was in block two last night, which was about the climate and um, teaching it to young learners. So there were lots of ideas in there, uh, very much on the lines of what uh, Christopher has just added. Uh, Christopher, if I were to choose one book to get me started in this area, what would it be? That's an interesting one. Um, if it's a, a, a book to understand the climate emergency, it would actually be that book. Though it's quite a big book. It's quite a heavy book. Um, English pastoral that I mentioned earlier, James Rebank, it's on one of the slides. Um, mm -hmm. As I say, it was written two years ago. It's an extraordinary book about one, his family have had that farm for about 400 years. And it's about one man's relationship with nature and how he changes his behavior. His farm is a business, but he changes his business to respond to the needs of nature. So we're going to say goodbye to uh, Chris and say say thank you very much for uh, a great uh, session, a really informative session.